just scroll through all there's Lynn. Hi Lynn. Hi. Barbara. Barbara is in the dark. <laughs> Ken, I will say I've been really impressed with how many people have attended your class consistently. Yeah, it, it, you seem to keep an audience, which is something a lot of LifeQuest classes don't. Uh, I mean, it just, you know, people have things they have to do or they have doctor's appointments, and but people are making time for your class, which is nice. Yes. Because it's so good. I hope it's enjoyable. It's entertaining, <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> What time if, if you want to go ahead and share your screen, it's about one minute till, and I'll just keep okay. letting people in. Yeah, and I'm going to go grab a timer right quick so that I don't okay. blather on past my time. Okay. Come on. There we go. Okay. Back in a moment. Well, that was fast. Okay. Oh, I should have picked this somewhere. <clears throat> okay, we're set. And we probably might as well get going. Uh, yeah, last week I was going to try and do mood, I mean depth, but uh, we just ran out of time. So this week I want to do depth because it's, it's a good thing to know a little about and how to use that. And the same with unity, tie in, tie in your picture together so it's uh, all one unit and not maybe two or three pictures trying to get out at the same time. So that's what we want to look at. I've included in your handouts a, a bonus uh, handout that I wrote about six pages on mood that I just finished up. It's a new one for any of you who have had my mood class before. Uh, this is a new one, I, uh, hopefully a little better than the last one. I try to improve on these things every time. So uh, it's there in the handouts and take a look at that. So we're looking at depth today and there's a lot of different ways to add depth to a painting. And probably one of the uh, easiest is just overlapping objects. Whenever you put one object in front of another, then the one behind it's obviously farther back in the picture. And so immediately you've increased the depth in your picture plane and uh, added more to it. Uh, just even adding sky, a background like that adds depth to a picture. Uh, and here's just some examples of uh, like this person here uh, in front of the piano. Uh, this makes a really a nice uh, contrast here with the black and white too. Uh, really brings that focal point right here on the face and the, the tip of the saxophone. I really like that a lot. And there's just lots of overlaps you can do. I mean, it's most a common thing you'll see. So uh, a good thing to use and think about when you're doing your sketches. It also lends us into uh, kind of a stage setting we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, value is also an important thing. A lot of landscape artists really use this a lot. And the, uh, the lighter an object is, the more it recedes into the distance. And that's why we oftentimes will make, uh, you know, mountain ranges in the background, make them fairly a light purple, light blue, gray, something like that. Makes them look more distant and farther back. Even though sometimes when you look in the real, in real life, sometimes those mountain ranges look really black and dark if the light's just right. But uh, often they're painted the other way. So you can change these around. Uh, we'll be talking about foreground framing and, and things like this, but uh, there's a lot of variation in this we can do. Uh, <clears throat> atmospheric perspective, again, another thing we often talk about, how the atmosphere, the air, affects what we see. And you can see in this really nice water painting by David Bellamy, uh, how, how light the mountain is in the background back there and a bluish cast to it. Again, just due to the air, we're going to get a bluish cast from light uh, reflecting off of dust particles, mainly in the atmosphere will do that. On a really super clear day, uh, you don't get near this bluish effect at all. And on, even on a quick sketch, like in the upper right hand corner there, uh, you know, put a little bit of a, a blue cast over that uh, building in the background and, and it makes it recede back there farther and it's lighter as well. 
So we get that atmospheric perspective and a, a useful device there. Uh, line weight, uh, this is something a lot of, especially beginning artists, uh, are not conscious of is the, the weight of the line. And usually we're happy just getting anything down at all and, and not thinking about, well, is this a heavy line or a light line or different colored line, you know, things like that. But in general, the heavier the line is, the more it's going to move to the foreground. So uh, if you were in making a mountain range or something and you made it in a really heavy, dark line, it would bring it forward when actually you were wanting it to go back. Uh, another way to make your lines work for you in, in depth is to change their tone. This example right here with the lions in it, we have ink in this foreground. In the midground back here, it's been switched to graphite pencil. And in the far background, we have a light blue pencil. So as we get lighter, uh, farther in the background, we get lighter with the tone of our lines. And uh, that again, increases the feeling of depth in the picture. So good, strong, heavy line in the foreground, less so in the background. Notice how wispy these lines over on the right. Uh, this is a sketch by Ronald Cyril get as we get to the background back here compared to the foreground we get uh, a lot heavier line more emphatic and of course more detail snap lines are something that we can use to really emphasize this <clears throat> and a snap line is just a really a bold outline that surrounds the center of interest or at least a big chunk of it and you can see on this uh monument in this uh, churchyard here how i put this real heavy black line around this sketch and so this being the center of interest really comes forward stands out everyone knows this is what you're talking about and as you see here in the midground i've got a little bit of ink line here but much lighter and past that i've just kept pencil line and so we get the whole thing receding back and by the time we get to the law the wall uh, i don't use any line at all and just uh, use watercolor on that and so we get this layer of depth, uh, sense of uh, depth feeling because of that. And we have multiple uh, layers of depth here. We have the center of focus in the foreground. Uh, as we go back, we've got this midground. And notice how the grass gets bluer as we go back. Sort of an aerial perspective. And again, a, a way to increase the depth through color. Also, we start losing detail in the stones. And uh, we've added a row of trees. We've got this wall here. That's another layer of depth with trees behind it. Again, we're layering uh, overlap. And we've got overlap within the trees. And then we have the sky as the, the ultimate background on this. But even in this sky, we've got a bird up here, which is it itself another layer. So we've got a lot of subtle ways here we can increase the depth in just a little sketch. Uh, by using some of these techniques. People uh, really work well to create a sense of depth. Uh, you can just put in all kinds of them and just by making them smaller, you're gonna increase the depth of your picture. The key to doing all of this is eye level line. Your first person, you can make any height you want. Uh, run your eye level line through here and all the other heads, notice all the heads, more or less hang on that eye level line. And you can make them any height you want. And the smaller they are, the farther away they are. But the, if you're on a level plane, say like a beach or, or a, a road or anything flat, uh, they're all gonna be like this. Now, if you're on a hill or a slope, all of this changes. But this is a, a good quick way to add depth. And uh, once you get to drawing people about this size, you can draw hundreds quick. They're really fun to draw and the smaller they get, the quicker you can draw them. So <laughs> you can really throw them in. You might just have one, one person that really looks like a person and the rest are just sort of little stick figure kind of things. Uh, tonal variation values, again, like we talked about, become a lot lighter as an object recedes in the distance. And uh, you can change this for various effects, but uh, notice these distant trees back here. Again, this is David Bellamy. I'm using a lot of his examples today. I really like his artwork. He's an English painter from Wales and uh, really does some nice landscape work. But uh, look at the tree in the foreground. 
detailed, dark as we get into the background. Everything's getting lighter. These hills, look how light these hills are, almost white. Uh, and then the, the sky, of course, in the background. Notice in this painting, he has probably used an underpainting of a very light raw sienna. Uh, could be a, a light yellow of some kind. Cerulean blue on top of it. But to get the white, he's come back in and used white gouache. Now, uh, there's a lot of confusion with gouache about what kind. Uh, if you're wanting something opaque and white, uh, you want titanium white gouache. Uh, if you want something that you can mix with other colors to make pastels or white glazes, then you want the zinc white or same thing as Chinese white. They're identical, zinc white and Chinese white. So, but they're very different, and the Chinese white, zinc white, just is, is more translucent. It's not opaque. So uh, definitely for, for a good white highlight, go with the titanium white gouache if you're needing something like that. I always keep some in my paint kit and usually find a, a use for it. It's a lot easier when you're out sketching to use white gouache than to try and mask off of an area. And sometimes you just inadvertently paint the area you wanted to remain white. And so you got to come back in and do something. You can't always lift it off. You can try and you can get some of it, but uh, something like phthalo blue, you're going to leave a lot of blue there. That's for certain. Another thing is color becomes less saturated with increasing distance. And this little sketch is a good example. Notice how orange the roofs are here in the foreground. As we get to the background, see kind of they're starting to get washed out. And uh, that's something you'll notice with a lot of colors is they tend to wash and, and then they tend to get a blue cast as well, just like we talked about with aerial perspective. So we've got that going on too. Uh, uh, something uh, that will increase the sense of depth is to start uh, washing out those colors a bit. Uh, going to a two point perspective always increases the depth compared to a straight on flat elevation view. When you're looking at that railroad car flat on like that, you have no idea how wide it is. It could be a mile wide and you know it wouldn't show up. Uh, but by turning it on its on a corner like this, you get two point perspective from this corner. You know, we'll get sloped down here to eye level and up here to eye level, and the same on this side. Then you can see depth and get a lot better idea of just what that railroad car looks like. And it's a, a good reason to use two-point perspective a lot of times is uh, to give you not only a better view of the object, uh, an idea of what it is, but also to increase the depth uh, and interest in your, in your picture by doing that. Shadows work well for this too. Shadows always really increase the feeling of depth in a picture. Uh, you know, there's got to be a recess if there's a shadow, and if there's a recess, then it's set back. And uh, the more we can add to that, the deeper it can get. Like on this uh, building over on my left, uh, the arrow is, see, we've got this first arch, and it's in shadow, and then we have a second one even back here, even farther, leading the eye farther back into that. And that's probably right here would be the center of focus, because notice this ladder here. It's just white against this really, really dark shadow behind it. So we get the most contrast right here and it really brings the eye there. Although we also have a secondary area right up here. It's got a lot of contrast with it too. But uh, at least for me, my eye seems to be drawn to this and this door where it's really dark. Here uh, on the, the lower uh, sketch down here, again, we've got these shadows. Uh, filling in and then a big dark door kind of a shape that leads us even farther back into the sketch. And so uh, that will really help us. Another thing you might notice on this sketch that uh, if you're not really looking close, you might not think about, but that notice how this is just a bit darker along this edge here of this shadow so that it can contrast with this white of the what is that a pediment that triangular bit right up here see how you've got this white line and it's emphasized anytime we can emphasize that contrast uh, it really helps and so we've got this nice little dark notch in here and make making this just a little darker than maybe it actually was in life will uh, really make this pop out a little better on this side notice how this side where he's put the lines over this 
Notice how it recedes so that this looks a little farther in front than this because the building is at an angle. We've got the two-point perspective. And just by toning this side down just barely and increasing the contrast on this side with this dark uh, shadow line here, we've made that building uh, look like it's uh, three-dimensional in space. It's, just, it's a very subtle thing, but it's very useful to think about things like that when you're sketching. So uh, top and bottom of the page also really influences people's thinking. It's just, uh, you know, it's really a convention. But the higher up on the page something is usually means the farther back in space that the object is. Like obviously back here, this is on the horizon. Uh, whereas down here, these people are below horizon line. And uh, so this object diminishing size and everything farther up the page, higher up, always will look uh, farther away than something lower down on the page, uh, like this for these foreground elements and people here. So we place something high. That's something to remember too, if you're uh, drawing anything, if you start too high on your page, you're gonna run out of room <laughs> if you're trying to go back. I do that a lot. Um, depth, uh, contrast really increases as objects get closer. You lose that contrast as you look in at farther and farther back. Again, we're losing color contrast like we talked about earlier. And the aerial perspective is causing us to lose a tonal contrast as well. So things are really kind of get fuzzy and hazy as we go away. And you can see this uh, center of focus on this boat here. It's really nicely done. It's very dark here. And we've got a white boat right here, just bright highlight right there running into that. Uh, I really like that. But if you'll notice in the background, it washes out to almost a, a pure white back in here. So uh, it really works well to give a sense of depth to this uh, harbor scene. Uh, really like this. Again, this is a David Bellamy painting I'm using today. Uh, here we detail. Notice how the detail just disappears as we go into the distance. If we put the same amount of detail all the way through, uh, it's very confusing to the eye. For one thing, you don't know where to actually focus on, what, what's important and what's not. And so uh, we want to make sure we know what the focal point is going to be and uh, not get a lot of clutter. We need a place for the eye to rest. The sky is really good for that a lot of times. If you have a, a really busy foreground uh, area here, you might have lots of people, lots of things going on. It's good to have a restful sky. It will give the eye a place to rest. If you have a busy, busy sky, uh, I like to make busy skies. For one thing, I think they're easier. But uh, also, then you've got busy down here and the eye just gets overwhelmed. So it's, you gotta have resting places. And notice this is a nice resting place right down in here. Uh, not much happening, your eye can go here. Here's all the action up in this major building. Then we got this monument here sticking up. Uh, this monument's really important, by the way, as far as balancing out the picture. If you take that away and cover it up, all of a sudden you, you got all the weight of the picture over on this side. Uh, probably if I were sketching it, I might have moved that monument over just a little bit more, and I think it would have given it a little better balance. But uh, you know, that, that's an individual subjective sort of thing and what's balanced to me might not exactly be balanced to you or others. But uh, you kind of go, it's a feeling and you kind of have to go with it. I move things around quite a bit. Uh, uh, for those of you that saw the Facebook announcement for this class, uh, I, I moved some chimneys around on that uh, picture. In fact, I even added one and uh, it needed it. So they should have put a chimney there when they built the place. <laughs> they didn't, so I had to add one. But it, sometimes you have to do that to balance a picture out, make it more interesting than it might have been otherwise. And after all, we're making paintings, we're not taking photographs here. So we want it to be interesting and still reflect the truth of the building or whatever we are sketching. Uh, edges soften with distance. Uh, it's, most of the time, again, if you've got a big high pressure system just came through in the middle of winter, 
and the air is just super cold and crisp and clear. Uh, you can see detail a long way off. Uh, but uh, for the most part, especially on a hazy uh, summer morning, you're going to uh, lose a, a lot of detail quickly. You're going to get a lot of soft edges due to the haze and moisture in the atmosphere. And so when you're doing your paintings or sketches, you don't want to have a really a hard line across these distant uh, hills or even these trees and everything. You want to go really soft on that and, and maybe just have a tonal approach really rather than uh, linear perhaps or use a very broken line and uh, a light one at that. So we want to soften those edges. Another thing in sketches that we make and paintings that we do for our own, think of it as a stage set. If you've been to the theater, you know, on the wings, usually on either side of the stage at the front, they'll have foreground elements. They might have, oh, in an outdoor scene, they might have little bits of tree or something like that. And then they might have a mid ground where every, all the action takes place and then a background drop behind it. And when we do our paintings, we can do that too. And we can do several layers. We don't have to just do three, but uh, this adds a lot to the depth. And uh, just looking at it broken down, here is our foreground. We have some trees on either side. Notice how these trees arc in and keep the eye end of the picture, kind of like parentheses around it. Uh, force the eye in. We've got darker up in these corners. That's something you can really do with sky a lot of times. You can't even just put a dark band of, uh, if you're doing graphite, a, a bit of tone right across the top of the page, and that will keep the eye into the picture too. But uh, the corners are usually where people will put most of their dark work like that. Trees work well, but notice this tree right here, how it's just hugging the edge of that frame. This tree is a lot better where it's leaning out a bit over. I would have tilted this trunk maybe just a bit, uh, just to keep from paralleling the frame of the picture. That's generally not something you'd want to do uh, compositionally. In our middle ground, we uh, have the action. People are usually going to be a focal point. Uh, anytime you got a person in there, they're going to be a focal point unless you do, do things to keep them from being a focal point. So here we have these and these trees, uh, a little bit of road going on here. And in the background, we have the city kind of escape uh, view, the view, a little bit of trees and everything. And we put it all together and uh, this is a picture we can get. So we have depth here because we've got a foreground, a middle ground, and then a background, and then deep background with the sky and clouds. So that gives us our planes there. And uh, that's what we need to make a picture. I thought this was really interesting here. Uh, making films, the old King Kong movies. Uh, here we have a light background painted on a board, as you can see up here in the upper right hand corner. Uh, the main action, the dinosaurs and King Kong are right here in the middle on a little stand. And then we have a dark foreground painted on glass so that the camera can film through it. And the result is uh, this image at the lower right. Uh, that they can manipulate the, the creatures and keep the, the foreground and the background the same this way and animate it uh, through, through the use of the video. I think that's really neat. Notice how the, the dark foreground works really well in this case with a light background. And also notice we're contrasting. If we've got a dark foreground, we're not going to have a dark mid-ground too, probably. There's always exceptions to everything. And notice with this mid-toned mid mid-ground, we have a light background to contrast against it. Uh, we could have a dark, but because these darker creatures here, it wouldn't show up nearly as well. So again, we use contrast, just like in everything, light against dark, dark against light, uh, all the way through. And we could have several layers like this, alternating like this light one here could be alternated now with another mid mid-toned background behind it or it could be a, a a very dark one either way but you wouldn't want another light one right next to it as they would just kind of merge together don't need that here's some examples this is one i painted out at scott a, a quick one and uh, 
just to illustrate this. And here we have a dark foreground, uh, these 10 buildings. And I purposely made these uh, much darker than what was actually there because you know, I'm painting a picture and uh, put a lot more rust on them. They were just your typical 10 buildings. And then I kept a mid-tone in the middle ground here and then a light background so that I'm alternating this dark mid-light. I could have approached this totally differently. I could have made a dark sky and maybe a light uh, mid-tone, like sunlight was shining on them and a storm behind, and maybe a mid-tone foreground. There's a lot of ways to change this around. Uh, I included this uh, picture here of uh, uh, this old uh, cathedral ruin. If some of you have had my class probably seen this before, but the reason I did it is I've used a very light foreground. As you can see, I didn't paint any of the stones. So we've got that very light. Now I've used basically a mid-tone in this building, but look a little closer. Down here, I made it darker. And that's usually because there's less sunlight getting down low than there are on high on a, on a building or anything. So the, most buildings are gonna be darker at their base. And notice I did the same thing down here on this uh, uh, granary over here. Uh, okay, so, but notice this really a dark sky behind it. So I can keep a mid-tone and still keep this fairly dark. But as we go up in the sky, notice how light the sky gets compared to the bottom of the sky. And because of that, I've progressively made this building darker towards the top, especially up here, so that it would contrast with that light background. So we actually have counter change going on here. So it's a, a gradation from very darkest in the sky at the bottom to its lightest up near the top. And because of that, I've got probably almost the darkest part of this building at the top, grading down lighter until we get to the very bottom where I can contrast it with this very light foreground. So that, that's the reason uh, when you see that, it, uh, you might not notice that. Here's just the six basic possibilities you can have in a layered composition. Uh, you know, a light foreground, a middle mid ground, dark background like we've been talking about or the opposite. But th these are other ways that you can do that too. Uh, so uh, here's a mid-tone in the background, a dark a middle ground, a light foreground. Uh, just just uh, lots of ways to approach this and a lot of variations within. And if you start adding other layers, well, pretty soon you can see the permutations just get endless. But the basic concept is always a lighter against a darker. So you can have contrast with whatever you do. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about unifying. Uh, a picture, things that will help it all tie together so it looks like one picture, not several pictures or competing elements in one picture that uh, try and fight for dominance, uh, anything like that, and especially in a sketch, you've overdone it because uh, you don't want uh, a lot of competition in it. You want people to see just what you're doing. So we're wanting to know how well this whole thing hangs together and what we can do to make it hang together. And, just looking at relationships in our painting and does it feel harmonious to us? Uh, you develop a feeling for that after a while and sometimes some things don't and you just have to think about it a while to even decide what's wrong with it to begin with. Uh, so we're going to do that. Tone paper is a great way to start. Uh, if you have a tone paper that pretty well unifies the whole image right there in one color. Uh, so good, good way to begin any kind of painting like that. Line unity, this Paul Seniak, I use a lot of Paul Seniak in this one, I think. And uh, notice the similar uh, pen strokes. Also, a lot of you maybe have uh, seen some of David Cook's paintings uh, where he's used pen work. His pen work is, uh, he has his own style of pen work and it very much uh, unifies his pictures a lot of times if he uses it uh, very much in his artwork. So you can see that it's kind of a similar stroke. People sort of develop a signature. When you've done a lot of pen and ink after a while, you just sort of make certain lines certain ways and it just comes out. It's nothing you need to learn to try and do or anything. It would be impossible not to do it, I think, if you do enough of it. Uh, 
you know, you can try and copy other people's styles that you like, but uh, it's going to, your own is going to come out. Uh, you ne never need to worry about your own style happening no matter what you do because uh, we're just all so different that uh, we just don't do things the same way. Uh, another uh, way to unify is through line elements. The, this one is strong horizontal feeling to it, uh, repeating horizontal lines, uh, contrasted with these really sharp verticals, which really uh, makes for an interesting composition, I think. Uh, I really like that. We have these long boards here. We have these stripes on the boards. Uh, these elements in the seashells and things laid out in a, a more or less horizontal line. Horizontal background hill back here or shadow, whatever that may be. Uh, very dark. But horizontal shadows on these, these poles and things. So uh, look, we also have horizontal lines up here in the sky. A lot of uh, unity of this horizontality feeling is uh, one of stability. Anytime you have a lot of horizontal lines, you're going to have a feeling of stability and rest, repose in your pictures. Uh, these verticals are there just again to contrast with it, to emphasize the fact that it is a really horizontal picture. I like that. Uh, tonal unity. Uh, oh, I've got some. Uh, Watercolors by Robert Wade here. I really like these as well. Uh, he's an Australian painter and uh, I think he's English actually, but lives there. But these are really nice. You can see tone unity. This is mostly a, a violet uh, painting. Uh, very little else in it. Uh, a little bit of uh, maybe raw sienna, uh, burnt sienna down here and in here, but otherwise it's pretty much violet and this co one color unifies the entire uh, painting, uh, just essentially different tones. So it's kind of a monochromatic painting. But it's a, a good way to unify a picture. You know, it all hangs together when it's all one color like that. Good way to start watercolor. Shape unity also works well. I, I really like this Paul Signac here. Notice these clouds, the blocks and cubes. You don't always have to make them cloud-like. And the reflections, again, we have this unity of shape down here in the reflection clouds in the water. So uh, really a, a great sketch he's made here. Uh, got the unity of the buildings, building shapes, pretty much the same, and the boats unified across here. And he's got a lot of unity in this, and he really needs it because the colors are just spot colors everywhere, and they kind of confuse the eye if you uh, look at this. They're just everywhere. He does often uh, juxtapose uh, complementary colors. Notice the orange sail. This nice blue shadow just happens to be here. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? <laughs> How it is here, this green boat just happens to be next to this red boat. Uh, lots of compliments in here and uh, really a nice way to paint. Here's some more green and red juxtaposed next to each other. Uh, this really makes the colors pop out more and become more jewel-like and brilliant because uh, they're, they're next to related colors like that. Uh, real, really good way to do that. Here again, here's a yellow-orange sail on a blue boat, complementary color. Uh, Signac does that uh, just almost every painting, you'll notice that. In here. <clears throat> Textural unity. Here's one I, I did one evening. Um, you see, you don't have to be very exact in your paintings all the time. Uh, this was very quickly done, probably 10 minutes, it was just a small sketch. But the texture is what holds the painting together. Uh, you could call it impressionistic or whatever you wanted, but uh, it's basically a textural painting of Oklahoma, as I remembered it growing up. And uh, so, that makes the picture hang together is that texture in the brushwork. Here's some more signac and look at color temperature. Notice everything is warm. There's just hardly any cool to even contrast with it. Even the blues are fairly warm except for maybe this one down here and here. Uh, they're a little cooler. Uh, that looks like pretty much ultramarine there. It's got a lot of red in it. That might be cerulean and a little cooler, but not much. And it's uh, placed against this orange spot, which warms everything up even more. So uh, a very warm 
painting throughout and that feeling of warmth really ties the picture together uh brings it together we even have purple water down here it's so warm so red feelings here's a, a nice painting again by robert wade and notice the warm tones throughout even these greens have been warmed up to uh, really essentially a brown a olive green brown to me it's brown uh color in in the tree leaves and everything so that everything is very very warm even these shadows have a very warm dark in them uh, warmed up with red probably lots of burnt sienna uh something like that in those shadows like that the, the stones gray stones here actually are nearly uh, a red value so uh, really warm picture you can also have the opposite with cool here's paul Signac again where almost everything is cool except the yellow in the sky and this uh, sunset uh, a little bit in the sail up here catching the, the warmth from the sun but everything else is, is a very cool uh, background of blue and, and violets got a little bit of a color compliment in here he couldn't help himself had to do that <laughs> there it is but it, of course it really makes that little bit of a, a walkway stand out too and, and helps this picture along lots of pencil strokes in this notice that are, are left in uh, he always sketched with uh, somewhere between say a three and a five B pencil, pretty dark pencil, and uh, left his lines in in his sketch. Notice the back runs here. You know, uh, we always worry about that and uh, watercolor and making a mess, but it's okay a lot of times. Just let it run. And it, maybe it's a cloud, maybe it's something else, you know. So don't really worry a lot about those sorts of things. Here's a very cool one. This is Robert Wade again, and this is the Scottish Highlands. Uh, we have these really nice, cool looking uh, uh, violety uh, flowers. These are probably bluebells. And uh, all of the vegetation here, very dark, dark green, uh, very cool, subdued colors. Uh, gonna have to do a lot of subdued color when you've got uh, lots of clouds and things. We've got aerial perspective, if you'll notice. Look how light it's getting on this mountain back here. As, as we recede into the distance, this one, this one's a little lighter than this row. This one's a little lighter, and then this one's still lighter still, and then we have the nearly white areas of the sky. Uh, that's something to think about when you're doing sky, is uh, need to remember that uh, on a cloudy overcast day, the sky's almost white. It's not gray, it's just barely gray. It's really a lot of white. So you gotta uh, watch for that, not get it too dark when you start. Same with water. The water is gonna be really light on an overcast day. Here's the temperature effects on the same painting. You see how, how really different a feeling you get from warm to cool uh, in these paintings as far as, but they both unify the picture. Uh, we've got this nice unity of blue across here and then yellow across here. So uh, really can affect the way the mood of something that feels feels like that. Value range or your key will unify a picture. This is a high key picture. Notice almost all the values are very light. Whereas down here we have a low key picture. Where all of the values are, are essentially very dark or tend to, to the dark dark range. And uh, it's a good way to provide unity and uh, interest to a, to a picture. In bright sunlight, you usually have just a pretty much a, a broad, complete tonal range, and you can use lots of bright colors. On a cloudy day, again, things start getting subdued. Notice how the color, you're not got a lot of brilliant color at all. Even this red bow just really subdued, have lots of grays in it. Uh, you got to figure on that when you do your painting and work out some mixes that are are not going to be too bright. If you made these boats bright, that bright blue and bright red, something would just look wrong with a cloudy gray day. Also, you don't see a lot of contrast in the shadows. Uh, the shadows are there uh, a lot of times, but uh, not near the contrast like you do over on this bright sunny picture where you'll see just almost black areas. Uh, you don't see that so much. Here they're going to be subdued grays and blues. 
Also, you want to use cooler colors on these kind of days in general. Uh, shadows are generally more blue. Uh, on a bright day, shadows could be a lot more purple, and even uh, a lot of oranges make good shadows on a bright day. Uh, unity from color dominance. This is again using some tone paper. This is blue paper and uh, just a few light washes over it and just makes a great picture and that, that tone of that blue just unifies the whole thing uh, with just a, a few other washes put on top of it. I'm running out of time so I'm going to get through these. Here's another one. This is on blue paper. Um, you can uh, See how it's all tied together. There's just an undertone feeling of the, the same color across this whole thing. And it really affects the way the colors of the paint show through, like you did on this little, little sketch here. Gives you a nice uh, overcast, stormy kind of day feeling. A limited palette is the next thing to go to. And here are just two colors, ultramarine blue and burnt sienna. And look at the range you can get with just these two colors. It's just a beautiful painting and uh, that's all, all you need. Uh, so limiting a palette can really unify and bring a picture together. Uh, I was going to spend some more time talking about unity here. Uh, very few colors with just two accent colors complementing each other. As you can see I made that car red. Uh, this was red and then I put in some green foliage down here. There was a couple of pots, but I added a little bit to it so that I'd have a little more green contrast, but otherwise pretty much unified colors in that. And here are just some possibilities of triads. Uh, I've got those listed. You can download this PDF and you can look them over, but notice how different these triads of color look. They unify the picture in each one but uh, because of a different choice of three colors to make them uh, really uh, influences how the, the final picture is going to turn out and the colors that you can mix with it. Now it's fun to play with triads. Uh, if you want a full spectrum one, uh, I probably would suggest not going with this one actually. I would suggest using, well, quinacridone rose would work. A magenta, a phthalo blue, and a Hansa yellow. That's pretty much what you get in the printing industry, plus black. That's what CMYK means, cyan, yellow, and uh, magenta, and black. So um, those are good ones for full spectrum. And you can just make up uh, any three you want. They don't have to necessarily be primer. Uh, just pick three colors and go with it, see what you get. But uh, these are some, and they're listed, and you can uh, download these and try it. Uh, this is our last session uh, for the spring. I'm going to do a, a one month, uh, four week session in July on beginning watercolor. It'll be really basic uh, materials and how to get a good quick start in it, uh, things to do and things to avoid. I can tell you a lot of things I did that you, you don't want to do and uh, a lot of things that a lot of people do that they shouldn't do. Uh, so uh, we'll look at it like that for any of you interested in, in wanting to have a quick uh, either refresher of watercolor or think you're interested in watercolor and want to give it a try. Uh, I'm going to be mostly doing demonstrations on this. I'm going to set up my camera so I can shine it down on my uh, uh, paint pad and, and I'll be doing a lot of painting and talking and we'll be painting along with me. Uh, we'll be using, let me get off of my screen share thing here in a moment. Uh, stop chair. Oop, try that. Hey, that went into my kitchen for some reason. Oh well. Anyway, uh, we'll be using a, a little light board. Uh, these are really inexpensive now, about $15 on Amazon. And I'll be uh, giving out some uh, things that you can trace and paint along with me. Anyway, that's it. My time's up. I could go on, but uh, I've really enjoyed it. I hope you all have had a good time, and uh, maybe we've all learned something. I always learn a lot more putting these together, I tell you. Well, you're going to have to stick around for a minute for everybody to say thank you, because I know they want to, and I'm going to start, because um, 
the generosity you have shown LifeQuest and our members with your time, but also the amount of work that has gone into these PowerPoint presentations. I mean, it's so impressive. And for